What Al-Qaeda really, really wanted in the wake of 9-11 was a Middle East theater of war. Their thinking was that the US had to be provoked into a long-term conflict in the Muslim homelands so that Al-Qaeda could have a long-term opportunity to demonstrate, as it sees them, its purer Islamic credentials. That's, that's precisely what Bush has given to them in Iraq, that kind of platform. The president would have Americans believe that the global enemy is a single army of terrorists, evildoers and bad folk, as he might put it. But his own military and other intelligence agencies have repeatedly argued that while, yes, there are some foreign fighters in Iraq, the insurgency is essentially homegrown and merely taking advantage of foreign help that would not be in Iraq and, more importantly, would not be welcomed in Iraq if the Americans had not made such a hash of the 2003 invasion. George Bush's simplistic equation, equation of who the enemy is also denies other real issues that need to be tackled. If John Howard and Donald Rumsfeld were to walk the teeming markets of Kabul or venture into the border refugee camps in Pakistan, they might revise their off-stated notion that poverty is not a breeding ground for terrorism. These places are prisons. There are no bars, but they're prisons of the mind, the heart, prisons of life. Rumsfeld and Howard are right on one point. The terror masters are not themselves driven by poverty, but they certainly do prey on and exploit those who are impoverished. Make an offer to a young man sentenced to a lifetime pushing a barrow among the fetid stalls of the street markets in Baghdad or Kabul, or who sits for years in the border refugee camps, and he'll take any escape route, be it the offer of an education, an entry visa to Australia, or a gun and a bomb kit. Stir into this mix a super propagandist like Osama bin Laden or al zarqawi and you can see how poverty and vengeance do mix. The repressed societies of the Middle East and Central Asia will remain the Islamic terrorist recruiting grounds for as long as nearly a third of their people live on less than $2 a day. And while the combined GDP of all 22 member nations of the Arab League is no more than that of Spain. Youngsters will be easily convinced of the greatness of strapping on a bomb unless they can enjoy the rights that we in Australia and elsewhere take so much for granted. Economic, political, educational, media and economic freedoms that are essential to creating the kind of middle class to which would-be bombers might otherwise aspire. Few outsiders can understand what happens to the human spirit in these places. A terrifying experience for me was to go alone to the Jalazai camp for fleeing Afghans on the Pakistani border back in 2001. There were 60,000 traumatized and frightened refugees. They took one look at me in my Western dress with a notebook and a pen and decided that I was there to help them and therefore that I would help them. They stampeded yelling and screaming for help in half a dozen languages, but their hope quickly turned to frustration. They grabbed and pushed and pulled at me. As the crowd pressed in, fortunately, three old mullahs materialized by my side. And I'm ashamed to say they used sticks to beat the crowd back as we inched our way to the perimeter of the camp so that I might be safe. These people had fled the beatings of Afghanistan, but here they were being beaten in Pakistan because of my carelessness. It's virtually impossible to define winning in the Bush war on terror. But the University of Chicago's political scientist, Robert A. Papps, has done a remarkable study of all 315 suicide attacks in the world between 1980 and 2003. His study is particularly illuminating on the need to do something for the Barrow Boys. He concludes that in virtually every instance 
into which they are recruited, the terrorist masters were attempting to, as he puts it, to compel modern democracies to withdraw military forces from territory that the terrorists consider their homelands. Crafting his own definition of winning, Papp sets a high bar for Washington. The US needs to defeat the current pool of terrorists more actively planning to kill Americans, which is more or less what Rumsfeld asked in his, posed in his question. But Papp also adds that they must prevent a new, potentially larger generation from rising up. We're not seeing that yet. Bush has articulated three goals to take the fight to the, three goals in his war on terror, to take the fight to the enemy and to advance freedom. Now, without loading the case with qualifications, you could argue that he has or is succeeding in Afghanistan. But he's failed on goals one and two in Iraq, and number three is a very shaky proposition. Yes, Saddam and his repulsive sons are gone, but we have yet to get a clear picture of what freedom in the new Iraq means. On the road, I try to write not so much about policy in the abstract sense of capital cities and remote leaders, so much as outcomes for people on the ground, ordinary people, who after the cataclysms we have visited on them, are allowed to be visited on them, might be entitled to a better deal. To this end, I use the period between the collapse of Saddam's regime and the establishment of the insurgency in Iraq to travel the country, exploring the power of the tribes and religious leaders and the role they play in governing the lives of their people, much as political power brokers do in our community. A vital element of the US failure in Iraq hinges on Iraq's deeply tribal culture. The problem is not so much the tribes as the failure by the US to understand and to respect them in those first critical months of the occupation. I've interviewed tribal sheikhs who in the years before the invasion worked actively as US spies against Saddam Hussein but who are now deeply committed to the insurgency because, if I can use an Americanism, they've been dissed or disrespected by Washington. The tribes predate Islam. Over time, they've become one of the great constants in the life of a region racked by conflict. But the Americans are not the first to challenge them. Muhammad, the prophet, railed against what he called their rotten ways. The British, they thought they could be co-opted against the Amer Ottoman Empire. And they could, but only briefly, while they with the British faced a common enemy in Istanbul. And in 1920, the tribes revolted against London too. So began a cruel 38-year war of attrition to rid old Mesopotamia of the British and their influence. Today, the sheikhs lounge on cushions on richly colored carpets and speak about legendary foreign figures in their history as though they knew them personally. Sinjin Philby, the father of the spy of the same name, who rode about the deserts on a motorcycle, a British diplomat in leathers, drawing lines in the sand that became today's often disputed national borders. Gertrude Bell, an Arabist, a diplomat and a spy who was dubbed the uncrowned queen of Iraq. And the man in whose shadow they all walked, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence's 1920 description of Britain's lunge at Iraq as not far from disaster proved to be correct. But if they care to look back, the Americans might be struck by the resonance of a warning by Lawrence that the people of Britain had been laid into a Mesopotamian trap. He said, or he wrote at the time, they've been tricked into it by a steady withholding of information. Things are far worse than we have been told. 
As the Americans pushed into Iraq in 2003, they encountered little resistance. One of the sheikhs at Ramadi, in the west of Iraq, explained to me why this was so. He said, our decision not to fight for Saddam was spontaneous. It's not that we didn't love him or that we did love George Bush. We simply chose the stronger side and we did it for reasons of self-preservation. The sheikhs could see that Saddam would go down, but the tribes of Iraq would not go down with him. Not when they were already dreaming about the deals they might strike with the forces of the richest and most powerful empire of all time, then marching on Baghdad. But things didn't work out as the sheikhs had hoped. The Americans seemed either unwilling or out of their depth when it came to understanding the tribal and religious culture of Iraq. They simply refused to engage in the political barter process anticipated so much by the sheikhs. As I sat in on a meeting of the American appointed municipal council in Abu Ghraib in 2003, before the events that subsequently drew Abu Ghraib to all of our attention, the mayor, Dari Kamas al Dari, was very precise in explaining to me who he was, where he fitted in, and where the Americans didn't fit in. I'm not a candidate of the Americans, he told me. I told them when they came here that if they could not work with the tribes, their enterprise would fail. It's still early days in Afghanistan, but much of the country still remains under the boot of warlords. None of the other candidates for a Washington makeover in the last 100 years was an Islamic nation. At best, the Arab countries embraced by the US might be described as liberalized autocracies, Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Algeria, and Kuwait. They have constitutions in flowery language that purport to guarantee many of the rights we take for granted in Western democracies, but their leaders survive by control and repression. Their self-serving security apparatuses are as ugly and their parliamentary oppositions where they have them, a joke. In truth, with the exception of Israel, democracy does not yet exist in the Middle East, and this despite the sorrow of so much Western intervention in the region over the years. Can it be planted in Iraq, which has known only occupation and puppet statehood, repression and ruthlessness since it was set up by the British in the 1920s? Supporters of the White House drive for democracy claim it's heresy to even pose this question. But for many other observers, the reality of the Middle East means that any attempt to foist the bottom-up principles and rights of democracy onto societies that are so top-down driven will require a decades-long commitment, if not longer. Or possibly, the attempt will simply fail, particularly if democracy is proposed at the point of a gun and if it's not backed sufficiently by humanitarian, cultural, and diplomatic efforts. Few of what the experts call the preconditions for democracy exist. Compared with the historical backdrop of post-war Japan and Germany, Iraq's history of colonialism, imposed monarchy, fascist revolution, Arab nationalism, and Islam leave little or no room for tolerance or trust. In this patriarchal society, much is made of the lack of the rights of women. But in the Iraqi culture, the reality is that nearly all have surrendered what we in the West think of as our democratic rights, either to their tribe or to their religion. The tribal sheikhs are born to rule, and many of the imams exercise the same hereditary powers, taking authority from a direct ancestral link to Muhammad the prophet, or by imposing a strict Quranic code on their congregations. The educated middle class that might have provided the fertile ground in which to plant democracy in Iraq all but fled the country during Saddam's rule. Some have gone back, most have not. <laughs>